Okay, it's time to listen to what God had to have to say to us. Let's turn in our Bibles to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. And let's read some very familiar verses. Philippians 4, starting at verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. All right. So, what would it take to get you to never worry again about anything in your life? What would it take? That is what God is commanding here, isn't it? God is commanding us, do not worry about anything in your life. Uh, it's not a silly question to ask, you know, uh, could you live the rest of your life without worry? God says, no, I expect you, I command you to live your life without worry. It's not a suggestion. Don't be anxious. Don't worry about anything, is what God says. Uh, Just what is worry? If you had to give a definition of worry, what is worry? Worry, it must be pointed out, is not concern. God commands us to be properly concerned about certain things in life. God commands us to be concerned about uh, our health, concerned about the welfare of our family, concerned about our nation and earning a living. Those are things that God wants us and commands us to be concerned about. What worry is is going beyond proper concern to dread and fear about the same things. Dread and fear is what makes the difference. Um, You find a lump under your skin and moves beyond proper concern to dread, to dread and fear. Uh, You look in your bank account and find there's $1,000 less than you expected there to be. Uh, That might cause dread and fear in you. Uh, You uh, have a child who's late coming home from an event and you don't know where they are. That can lead to dread and fear very easily. We all know this isn't anything that every one of us doesn't know extremely well uh, and God, what does God say about circumstances like that? Don't do it. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Don't be anxious about it. Now, the big question is how. We know that. Uh, we know we shouldn't worry, but some of us are characterized by worry. Uh, the topic of this sermon and the next sermon are how to not worry. This is a command. This isn't like, wouldn't it be nice? God's saying, I don't do want you to ever worry about anything. Uh, But thankfully, not only does God tell us not to do it, he explains how to get out of it. And in this passage, the the rest of the chapter, there are five different responsibilities we have uh, in order to keep this command. Today we're going to look at the first two. Um, How do we not worry? It's right here. Uh, And if we don't worry, what will happen? If we will obey his commands here and not worry, God says we can have peace instead of worry. The opposite of worry, right? Look at verse 7 again. It says, And the peace of God, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is what we like instead of worry, right? Well, how often does God want us to be at peace? Always. Worry never, peace always. Uh, It's a peace that passes what? It's a peace that passes all comprehension. You know, there's the piece you can comprehend and understand, and then there's the piece that you can't understand. He says, that's the type of peace I'm talking about. I'm not talking about peace from people, peace of God. God's peace is what you can be, what you can have. And then he says, what will that peace do for you? He says, it will guard. The word guard means to stand at a military uh, activity. Uh, protect with military might as a guard standing in front of a door with a gun God's peace which you can't really understand will stand as a guard over what two things your hearts and your minds your hearts filled with feelings of dread and worry and fear and your mind filled with thoughts of dread and worry and fear God's peace will stand guard so make sure that they are protected from worry and dread and fear And let his peace be there instead. Would you like to live that way? God would like us to live that way. But we have to make certain choices to get that done. And we're going to be looking at what those choices are. You know, I've talked to some of you over the years when you've gone through really 
bad circumstances, and many of you have told me, you know, I could feel the prayers of the congregation. I could feel it. That's what we're talking about here, the peace that passes understanding. God sends that upon us, and he wants us to have that. Jesus had that. Uh, remember at his trial before the Sanhedrin, he was composed and calm, and there he was just answering their questions and dealing with their hatred, and you know, just they wanted literally to kill him. And he just stood there so composed, and yet earlier in the evening, he was not composed at all, was he? He was on his hands and knees on the ground in the Garden of Gethsemane, crying out to God. He says, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. That's how disturbed he was. And yet, just a few hours later, he was completely composed. The peace that passes understanding was upon him. And that's what he wants us to have in our lives, too. So do you need that peace this morning? Can you think of something that has you worried? Is there something that has you worried today? Think about that. Now realize God commands you don't do that. And instead, I'm going to show you some things that you can do to have my peace that passes all understandings and it will guard you. All right, let's look at what those are in the passage before us in Philippians chapter 4. And as we go to this chapter, we want to remind ourselves of the background here. It will help us to appreciate a lot more. Do you remember where Paul is as he writes the book of Philippians? He's in jail. Uh, probably in jail in Rome. Uh, that's not exactly clear, clear, but probably in jail in Rome. And we have in Acts 28 a description of what he went through in jail in Rome. It says in Acts 28, verse 17, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. It is because of the hope of Israel, Jesus, that I am bound with this chain. Can you hear the frustration in his voice here? He's in jail, and he's saying, look, I've done nothing against our people or our customs. In other words, I am falsely accused. I'm standing here falsely accused. He says, I'm not guilty of any crime. They actually held a trial and said, no, he's not guilty of anything. And yet, because of the Jews' insistence, he was still being held uh, in, in court, and he appealed to Caesar because the Jews were not, weren't interested in the outcome of the verdict. They were interested in killing him. And so he said that I was forced to appeal to Caesar. Even though my trial found me guiltless, the Jews, to escape them and their wanting to kill me, I appealed to Caesar. So here he is in jail at the moment that he's writing these words that we're reading this morning. Uh, he is uh, found innocent and yet faces death anyway because he has to appeal to Caesar. And now it's just a matter of time. When I get my trial, it'll determine whether I live or die. How would you be feeling? the big unknown. Are you going to live or die? And you're in jail, in chains, in prison. But you say, well, this is the great Apostle Paul. He you know, can weather anything. He's a great man of faith, and this wouldn't bother him at all. It's not true. We don't find Paul complaining, not once, in the book of Philippians in front of us here. But there's a couple comments he makes that tells us what he's really feeling. Um, I'll show you. You could look back, but I'll show you on the screen here. Back in chapter 1, verse 30, he says, you have seen me suffer for Christ in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of great struggle. That's what he calls his imprisonment, great conflict, great struggle going on inside him. Look, this is Paul. He's been all over planting churches. He's been used by God in powerful ways, and now he's just sitting in chains. And you can imagine the struggle he has. I can be out there preaching. I can be out there saving souls, starting churches, getting God's word out. I was commissioned as an apostle to the Gentiles. I'm supposed to be doing this. And he's now just sitting in a dark cell. He says he's facing great struggle. And that great struggle caused sorrow. Sorrow in him. Look at, uh, if you look at the next chapter, Philippians 2.27, it says, Epaphroditus was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. So a man was ministering to him there, Epaphroditus, and he got sick, got so sick he almost died, but God spared him. And Paul says, didn't just spare him, he spared me from having sorrow at his death upon sorrow. What's that sorrow? That's being in jail. So he's saying, being here, 
number one, is a great struggle for me and great sorrow for me. So Paul isn't sitting there happily, you know, in that dark cell, you know, just sitting there and, you know, this is going to be great. You know, I don't have to do anything. No, he is great conflict, great sorrow going on. And yet, he's not worried. Remember, worry is the dread of fear, dread and fear over what's going to happen. And yes, he has conflict of not being able to be out and preach. And yes, he has sorrow over the misery that he's going through. But he doesn't have worry over dread and fear of what's going to happen. Why, Paul? How can you sit there and not worry about what's going to happen to your life? Well, it's very likely it's because, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> That's what we're going to look at. He shares with the Philippians how to move from worry to peace. How to move from worry to peace. And that's what we want to be able to look at uh, as well because the same principles apply to us. And maybe you're here this morning, you're eaten up by worry about something. God says, don't do that. I'm going to show you a way to move from worry to peace. And that's where I want you to be, to have that peace that passes understanding. So as we go through these verses, think of something that has you worried. And now let's see what God says to do about it. And as we look at verse 6, the very first thing uh, that it says, don't be anxious for anything but what? Pray. And that's the first step. And you insert there, pray for God to bring good. Pray for God to bring good. You're never going to move from worry to peace without first praying. The end of verse 6 says, let your requests be made known to God. By prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known. Uh, did anyone, anyone ever say to you, hey, look, you need to just stop worrying. Stop worrying. And then walk away. That doesn't help, does it? No. And that isn't what God's message here is. God doesn't just say stop worrying. God says replace worrying with prayer. That's what these verses are saying. He doesn't just say stop it and then walk on. He says replace it. Don't worry and instead turn that energy of worry into prayer. And this just makes sense. We all know this. This is a first obvious step. It probably doesn't even need to be said. But how often do we not do that? How often do we run around trying to fix everything, and when we can't get it all fixed, then we say, oh, well, I guess we've got to just pray. That's the only thing we can do. And Paul's saying, no, no, no. The very, very first thing you should do is pray. I remember years and years ago, I had a money problem. I didn't know where the money was going to come from, and I was really worried about it. And my cousin stopped by my house, and we were talking about uh, this this problem, and he said to me, "How much time have you given to praying about this?" And I just hung my head in shame. I thought, "I haven't given any time of prayer to it. All this energy, all this phone calls, contacting people, worrying. What am I going to do?" And never once have I prayed about it. God's peace that passes understanding is there for us, but it's not going to happen if we don't pray. Okay? He says, "Here, I have it for you, but you got to start with praying." Look at verse 6. There's a couple things to point out here. In what types of things are, are we to pray? In what? In everything. In everything. By prayer and supplication. Do you ever think that there are certain things that are just too small to pray about? Nah, I shouldn't pray about that. That's just too dumb, too small, too little. Look, if it's large enough to worry about, it's large enough to pray about. Okay, don't ever think that something is too small. It says right there, in everything. Not just the big things, the major things, in everything, prayer. And then look again at verse 6. What should we pray for? It says, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your, what's the word? Requests. It could say needs. It doesn't say needs. Do you ever think, you know, oh, I can pray about my needs, but, you know, my wants and desires and requests, those things I shouldn't pray about. That's kind of being selfish. No, 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 no. If you have a request, pray about it. God loves you. He cares about you. Remember I told the story about the woman who was in prison and, uh, for, for her faith in some Asian country. And she said, Lord, one day, I just, I, I'm here. I'm so miserable. This food is terrible. But please, could you just give me a banana? I'd love a banana. Like within one day, a banana shows up in their food rations. There's no explanation for that except that God answered her prayer. God cares about us. If you are just praying about the big things or the things that seem important or just the needs, you can lower that down to small things and requests and desires. God is saying here, just pray. Just 
Get out there and pray. Whatever is on your heart, whatever is on, in your uh, feelings, pray about it. That's what I want you to do. This was Jesus' first step in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, what did he want? I don't want to go to the cross. And so what's the first thing he did? He got on his knees and he prayed. Prayed three times. Father, take this away from me. Paul had his thorn in the flesh given to him. He said, God, I don't want this. It makes me weak. Terribly, terribly weak. And he goes, just like Jesus, prays three times for God to take it away. How about you? Are you praying about that thing that I asked you to think about a minute ago? How much prayer have you given to that? That's really important. Because I'm convinced that God could say, oh, yeah, there you have it. It's all gone. But God's more important of how we get through it than that we get through it. Because it's in the how that we grow and become more like him. It's in the how that our character is transformed. That's what God's really. You know, if you need money, God can give you money. If you need health, God can give you perfect health. It's in how you deal with it that God is most concerned about. Start with prayer. Prayer is just dependence upon God, isn't it? That's what he wants. To throw aside everything else and to say, I need you, help me. Are you doing that with your worry this morning? If you are doing it, keep doing it. That's the first step to moving from worry to peace. The second step is also found in verse 6 in two words that are often overlooked, very easy to overlook. Verse 6 says, In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Those can be sped over real quickly, but they're really important. With thanksgiving. How many times have you gone to prayer, you pour out your heart to God about your worries and your needs, and you get up, and you walk away worried and full of dread. How many times does that happen? That's a very, very common experience. Why do we do that? The answer is because we don't hear God saying, yes, I'll take care of that. We don't know that's going to happen. We hope that he's going to take care of that lump. We hope that he's going to take care of that financial need. We hope that our children are going to arrive home in, in one piece after being out late. But we don't know, do we? If we could see the future and God said, look, see, there it is. The lump is nothing. Finance is okay. Kids are okay. We'd say, oh, then you could pray with thanksgiving. God is saying, I want you to pray with thanksgiving without knowing the future. See, most of the time we end end praying and we ask God for these things and there's just silence there. We may even ask God, God, just give me a sign about something. And oftentimes it's just silence and we don't know. And it's that not knowing that creates worry. But God is telling us here, I want you to pray with thanks anyway. So picture Paul in prison there. He's awaiting his trial. It's going to determine whether he lives or dies. He's sorrowful. He's conflicted and struggling. He prays to God, number one. But now, how is he supposed to give thanks? He can't see the future. Or can he? Because five years earlier, Paul wrote the book of Romans. And God inspired him to write this. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. I picture Paul in prison. If he truly believes these words, will he worry about the future? He doesn't know if he's going to live or die, but if God has made this promise, you know, whatever loss you face, it's going to end up in good. Would Paul worry, sit there worrying? No. This is God's promise. God's promise, all possible loss will be worked for our good. That's his promise here. This is in your insert. Yes, Paul would have conflict. Yes, Paul would have sorrow. But Paul doesn't have to worry about his future because he knows that it's not going to end in conflict and sorrow. Not if God's promises are true. God's promises, you might go through sorrow and hardship, but it's not going to end in sorrow and hardship. It's going to end in good. That's God's promise. So why should Paul worry? It could get bad, but it's not going to end bad. It's going to end good. This gives us a definition of worry then. 
Here's a definition of worry. Worry is when we don't believe God will work our circumstances for good. Isn't that right? Isn't that what's happening when we worry about that lump or the money or our kids? God's not going to keep his promise of Romans 8.28. See, we can say we can believe Romans 8.28, but our actions reveal if we really do. And if we're worrying, we don't. If we're worrying, we really don't believe Romans 8.28. It's going to end bad. Or I think it's going to end bad, or it's possibly going to end bad. But if we say, no, God can't break his promises. God keeps his promises. He says, in not some things, most things, 99% of things, all things, God works for good to those who love him. Then that means this is going to turn out good. And I don't need to worry. So how do you move from worry to peace? Number one, you pray for God to bring good. And then number two, on your insert here, thank God for promising good. Thank God for promising good. That's with those words, pray with thanksgiving that he's promising good. It's going to come out of your, wor- your potential worry. You're not supposed to worry. What common things do we worry about? You know, people worry about going on first dates. How's that going to go? People worry about a job interview. How's that going to go? Some people worry about their cat using their office floor as a litter box. <laughs> yes, that happened to me this week. <laughs> Uh, what was my worry? That this would not be a one-off thing. <laughs> that this would continue as it has in other places of the house. Um, God says, don't worry about it, Clark. It's going to be okay. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, but what, do, am I supposed to get used to scrubbing the floor? Am I supposed to, um, you know, uh, take a bullet and put the cat down? <laughs> <Am> I, <laughs> I love the cat, and uh, I want to keep things as if they've always been going, but I don't want... You know, I'm worried. <laughs> the expensive vet uh, prices and all that stuff. What do I do? So I know what to do. God says, don't you dare worry about it. Number one, pray. Pray for good. Okay, I can do that. Number two, thank him for good coming out of this. I can't see into the future, but God says he can. And he's telling me what lies at the end of this process, and it's good. And I think, oh, okay, well, if that's where it's going to end, end up, I can. I can not worry about that. Now, does that mean I won't go through scrubbing the floor and going to the vet and maybe even putting my cat down? No, I can't guarantee that. But God says that whole process is going to end up in a good place if I'll practice what he says here. You know, if I don't pray and I complain instead of giving thanks, I'm going to slow down any good that's supposed to come, and I'm going to uh, include a whole bunch of pain that isn't supposed to be there. But if I will obey these things, it's going to end up in a good place, he says. So uh, it doesn't mean that we'll escape suffering. That's not what this promise says. It says it will end in good. So that first date might go terribly, or that job interview might go terribly. Um, But God's promise is that any loss that you face will end up in a good place. It'll end up for your good, for those who love him. That's a wonderful promise. Oftentimes we don't see the good. Sometimes God shows us the good. And those are real times of rejoicing, you know. You have a terrible first date and you realize that person wasn't later someone you would never have wanted to get involved with. And you say, Phew, thank you. That was a good thing. Uh, Paul is there in prison. Terrible circumstances, limits what he can do, suffering there. What's good as a result of this? He starts writing letters like the one we're reading which thousands of years later are giving us God's word into our lives. God worked it for good. Uh, When we worry, we're saying we don't believe God's promise to bring good. But when we thank, we are. We're living by faith. God's asking us to live by faith here. You've got your worry, pray about it, and live by faith, and thank God that good is coming through it. That it'll somehow be used for good. It doesn't mean the things inside it are good. But God will work it together for good. So think about something that's worrying you. God commands you don't do it. Number two, you could face terrible loss. So what's going to happen? Number one, pray. Are you praying? Don't be guilty of doing everything else but praying. Don't let James's promise that you 
don't have because you're not asking. Be true about you. How much prayer are you putting into that thing? If you haven't been putting much into it, put a lot into it. If you've been putting a lot into it, keep doing it. It's the first step. And number two, are you thanking God for his promise to work good? He promises to take whatever loss you're, you're scared of and using it for ultimate good. Um, as I said, that doesn't mean you won't have suffering. That lump might be cancer. That $1,000 may be permanently missing. Your child may be in a car accident. But God says it's not going to end in a bad situation like that. You're just seeing the middle of the story. The end of the story, God says, I can see it, and I know what it is, and I'm working it for good in your life. Will you, by faith, give me thanks right now and relieve yourself of the burden of wondering? So God says, if you could see down the road, you'd see what I see. It works for good. And I'm asking you, by faith, to see ahead and to thank even though you don't see. So thank because you trust me, that I'm in control, and that I love you. Are you doing that in whatever thing has you worried? If we want the peace that passes understanding, we've got to pray and we've got to keep praying. And we've got to give thanks and keep giving thanks. Give thanks today. Give thanks if it's not resolved next week and if not resolved next month and next year. Just keep thanking the God. I know you'll end this in good because you keep your promises. And remember, this promise is not for everybody. It's for the Who? For those who love God. So if you're here this morning and you don't really love God, he's not really that important to you, you need to be worried. You need to be worried about what's coming. There's the punishment of your sins coming. And you need to be afraid of that. But let that fear and worry drive you into the arms of Jesus. Because he loves you. He died for you. And he made it possible for you to have peace with God. So he forgives all your sins, and now he's your father, and now having peace with God, you can have the peace of God that passes all understandings in your daily life. So make sure that you've let go of everything else and love Jesus with all your heart. So pray and then give thanks. And what lies, a health, what lies ahead for your health concerns? What lies ahead for your health concerns? God working everything together for good? What lies ahead for your financial concerns? God working all things together for good. How about every problem that you face? God says, if you love me, I will work everything together for good in your life. All possible loss will be worked for good for those that love him. Let's go live that way.